Well, hello everybody, welcome to Red Toolhouse. On today's video, uh, we're going to give an update that we promised uh, concerning our pigs, what we're going to do with them. Well, for those of you that have followed the channel for a while, you know that we've obviously had a little bit of setbacks with our pigs here lately. We've been raising pigs now for over six, going on seven years, and throughout that time, I've had really good success here lately, fairly not so great. The latest was Merida's fiasco uh, here in our farrowing barn. I'll link to a video here. Coming back and analyzing all this stuff, again, it's it's one of those things where day job, farm, rub against one another. I, I believe I could have minimized the loss with Merida had I had my light set up. I was planning on getting my light set up. Um, she fared that night. The plan was to set up the light that morning, so uh, calendar was off a little bit again. Um, a lot of you guys have commented, and I agree, there was way too much hay in here. I had a big bale of hay that I've just kept in this area. And they spread it out. She nested quite a bit with all that hay uh, that contributed to it. But also, one of the things, if you go back and look at that video, you'll see she's really, even when it's time to eat, after she's fared, she's plaster, past her placenta, all that. It was very, very hard for her to even get up to eat. In fact, she just kind of moved over on her knees to eat to be able to, to access the food bowl. So the weight, uh, you know, her weight... Uh, her age, all of those things, I think, were contributing factors into uh, losing some of her mothering skills. They've all been good mothers. You know, this is this is the grandmother. This is Abigail. She's our one of our original pigs. Uh, her daughter is Merida, the one that we had issues with. And then these, this is mother, daughter. Um, this is, who is this? This is Mercy, and that's Matilda. Um, and Molly was her mother, who we retired quite a few years back. Which one of y'all took a dump in the barn, huh? <clears throat> so what's been interesting, and I've just kind of pick this up over time as I've been interviewing more and more people on our Pastured Pig podcast, talking to other uh, pastured operations across the country, it's a little bit of a round peg into a square hole situation here where I'm taking some of these uh, production breeds, like CAFO production, like a Hampshire, uh, Duroc to some degree, that... Um, may not do as well on pasture. So looking at, you know, is my breed line, am I trying to put a round peg in a square hole by choosing a breed line that um, isn't necessarily geared for pasture? Uh, they, they forage okay, but you know, after talking and visiting other farms and seeing what some of these other breeds are doing, those other breeds are, are foraging much better and able to handle the pasture much better. So that really got me thinking. Could you move please? Yeah. Who's going to move first, the 200-pound guy or the 600-pound pig? So through much deliberation and discussion, um, and even some debate, we've decided that we are going to we're going to get rid of all of our pigs. We're going to completely eliminate our herd and uh, take all these girls to uh, process, which is going to be tough because some of them have become pets to me. But uh, I can't just put these pigs down. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to keep them on the uh, farm and, and not get anything out of them. So if I'm going to put them down, I'm not going to waste all this meat. We're going to process them. Uh, we'll consume some. Uh, some will go to the nonprofit uh, shelter that we've helped support over the years and worked with for quite a while. Uh, you've seen us document some of that in our videos. So we'll. So they'll go to help feed the homeless, to help feed uh, people overcoming addiction. And of course, they'll help feed us. So it'll be bittersweet. We've got a date scheduled to take them to the processor. Just got to get them loaded onto a trailer and get them ready to go. Oh, this one will be tough too. Matilda really likes, she likes human interaction here. So is that the end of pigs uh, on Red Toolhouse? Is this where our pig path comes to an end? Um, hopefully not, uh, actually not. Uh, we've already been in discussions with um, another farm in South Carolina, a farm by the name of Six Oaks Farms, run by David Crafton. If you guys listen to our podcast on Pastured Pigs, I've interviewed him twice, I've gotten to know him over the past year, I really like what he's got going on down there, really like his setup, really like what he's, his genetics are producing. Um, it's a really a nice combination of, of production level pastured piggery with incorporating heritage breeds, uh, something that incorporates better onto pasture, uh, has better uh, 
open air, open pasture farrowing situations. So uh, real quick, before I get into explaining what we've got going on, I wanted to announce the winner of the flashlight from taking the survey. Those of you guys that took the survey, we said we we're going to do a drawing. So we, we drew that and the winner is uh, Brad M. from Beth Alto, Illinois. So uh, Brad, I've already reached out to you and you've given me your address, so your flashlight is in the mail. So a little detail on Six Oaks Farm in Jonesville, South Carolina. Dave's got about 40 acres down there and he's got a lot of experience. He's uh, 20 plus years experience raising livestock, raised cattle up in, uh, in Maryland, I believe, before moving to South Carolina. Again, if you wanna know more about his farm, you can obviously check out uh, his website, his Facebook page, and then even the uh, podcast that we've interviewed him on. So I can, I'll link all those below. While his farm is polyculture, he, he still raises beef. He raises the pork, of course, and does, uh, I believe he does uh, vegetable CSA, those type of things on his farm. Um, I, I think his, his pig area is really where he's really growing. And he does raise pigs to sell for cuts, uh, to sell you know finished product to, to customers but I think he's really growing the largest in his breeding area. And he ships all up and down the Eastern seaboard. He's, uh, he's able to take orders and, and uh, you know, deliver pigs to farms all up and down the East Coast. He does raise more of the heritage breeds. He's, he's actually working, one of the podcasts we talked about, he's actually working on his own breed line. Uh, so that's a whole nother discussion that's worth listening to. Uh, but you really like what he's going on there with his his farrowing operations, he farrows naturally out on pasture, even as large as he is. He does not confine, doesn't do anything like that. So let's answer the obvious question. What are we getting from David? Well, we're getting 14 pigs. And out of those 14, we're going to have one boar. We're going to have at least four uh, breed-worthy gilts. And then the rest we're going to fill in with barrows and, and then other gilts um, to kind of round out that herd. These pigs will, all these pigs will be around 12 to 14 weeks, give or, give or take a couple weeks, because uh, they didn't all come from one litter. There's going to be some, some different litters integrated there. But by the time they hit Red Tool House, they'll probably be about 12 to 14 weeks old average. So they'll already be weaned. Um, the barrows, of course, to be barrows are already going to be cut. Uh, Dave's already going to have the warming regimen taken care of. Uh, he does inspection, hernia inspections, all those type of things. So really like how he prepares his, uh, his pigs before they go out to his customers. All of these pigs, uh, the breed line they come from, the sire is a large black, large black boar, and the dams are Tamworth blue butt crosses. So I really like, I like the confirmation he's getting uh, from that large black Tamworth blue butt cross. So for those of you that follow the channel for a while, you're scratching your head and say, wait a minute, Troy, did you just say there's going to be a boar in that group? Yes, yes, we are going to try a boar. Uh, so one, one, of the, uh, one of the 14 coming will be a large black boar, and uh, he's going to be a youngin', but uh, he's, he's going to step up and be the breed source for our herd going forward. We're going to try that. So getting a boar doesn't mean we're giving up on AI. I've done multiple, multiple years of AI. I've been, been happy with it. Most of all, there's pros and cons to both sides, of course, uh, but I, I think, well, I really can't, I really can't say I've done a lot of a pastured pig operation until I have a boar on, on farm. And I, you know, maybe something that I regret and maybe something that I, I move away from later on down the road. But right now I'm just anxious to try it. Really some of the reasons that, that kind of push me over to that side of getting a boar are uh, one of the obvious is, you know, I just haven't had much luck with the AI here lately. And again, it's, it's not the AI per se. It, it was, it's maybe my processes, my practices, all of that mixed together. Uh, again, want to introduce some additional uh, genetics, different genetics than, than what I'm getting from my source, more heritage line genetics. Um, I really want to see how a boar will, will be managed and handled on, on the farm. So it's kind of almost, I want to have one so I can say that I have one and I've tried it out. Uh, you know, something that's always stuck in my mind too, and this, this, this kind of get, gets a little bit doomsday, almost prepper-ish, uh, is every time, anytime I have a litter and I cut that last little boar piglet and make him a barrow, I think I've just broken the loop. I've broken a cycle. If, if the bottom would fall out and I'd need to maintain livestock to be able to reproduce, I, I, I don't have the ability to do that because I just eliminated my boar. So keeping a boar will obviously, uh, you know, if, if there is an issue and, and my AI sources dried up, I couldn't get those, 
then I'd be able to, to reproduce you know, right here on farm. And also the closed loop element of that. I always, I always touted that AI was a closed loop in itself, that you, know, you don't have to have, you're not bringing a boar in from somebody else's farm or you're not taking your, your gilts or your sows to somebody else's farm where there's an opportunity for disease uh, swapping there. Just because I'm using AI doesn't mean I'm immune from disease coming from that boar line. That obviously a lot of disease can be transmitted in that semen. And honestly, you know, looking at the economics of this, um, I usually spend about 200 to $250 per round of AI. So when it's time to breed my sows, and I usually breed two, maybe try to breed two or three at a time, I've got about $250 tied up completely, shipping, semen, all the supplies, all those type of things. Um, and that's once a year. Well, I'd like to step up my breeding operation. And instead of just having once a year litters, maybe have twice a year with a rotation there, or maybe possibly even three times a year, depending on how things take off. So that adds up pretty quickly when you look and say, well, 250 annually versus 750 annually. That makes the AI a little more costly over the year, whereas a boar, of course, you know, you're just paying you know, three hots and a cut. That's what you're basically providing a, the boar is just food and, and shelter uh, after that initial purchase. So we're, we're going to see how that shakes out. And, and of course, I'll be tracking all of that. You know, the biggest challenge with the boar that I'm you know, thinking of and I'm going to experience, of course, is just keeping him separate. Uh, we'll have to have uh, strong dividing lines. You know, if I don't want him mingling with, uh, with the gilts and breeding him just yet, or you're trying to get on a schedule, my schedule, not his schedule, then of course, I've got to have the infrastructure in place to, to maintain that. Now he's going to come young, so he, he's not going to be pitching yet when he gets here. So I've got some time to wait for him to mature as I, I figure out exactly how I'm going to lay this pasture out. I've got, I've got some ideas and uh, feel comfortable with where we are right now with infrastructure. So uh, we'll just have to do some more tweaking here in the next couple months. So why 14 pigs? If I'm not going to breed all of those, why am I buying 14 pigs? Why am I buying a herd that size? Well, this is now going to be the second year of, um, if, if I don't do this, it'll be the second year of not having finished product for my customers. And my customers are great, but you know they're obviously looking for product. And one year, okay, two years, I'm gonna to start to lose some customers there. There's just you know, people looking for quality pork. They're gonna obviously need to go somewhere else if I don't have any product. So getting 14 allows me to have my breed stock and allows me to finish some out as well. So the age that these pigs will be when they get here, then we'll be able to finish those out early summer or midsummer and have some product for my customers here in less than six months. Why the number 14? Well, quite frankly, it really was kind of where my budget landed. Uh, out of pocket on all of this, you know, the cost of the pigs, transportation, all of that, I'm going to be about 1100 bucks, And that's, that's pretty much where my budget was. I didn't want to get too deep into that. Of course, the additional expenses I'm going to have at the same time are going to be processing my four large sows. You know, those aren't going to be cheap probably be a, uh, almost a grand in a cost there. Uh, so another 1100 in, in acquiring this herd, you know, that's, that's a pretty big swing of about a little over $2,000 all in one swoop right after Christmas. So that, that hits you right in the wallet. <laughs> and mentioning the transportation, where David is in Jonesville, South Carolina, it's actually cheaper to use his transportation service to bring him straight to my door than it would be for me to take an, uh, a neighbor's trailer all the way down there, load them up and come back. By the time I factor in gas, uh, you know, any potential issues with uh, you know, truck, tires, trailer, that type of thing. And of course, just overnight stay, uh, food, and then of course, just managing, uh, managing pigs on the road that long. Um, it's, it's just really nice to put all that liability back on somebody else that does this for a living, transports hogs all the time, and he can roll them right up to my front door and all we do is pull a pin on a gate and there we go. So I really like David's setup. Not only is he producing the product, but he has logistics figured out as well. So what's our timeline? Well, the timeline right now is um, 1st of January, the sows go to processing. So David's gracious enough to hold off delivery of the new herd till I can get the old herd out. So uh, 1st of January, we're taking the sows to processing. And then after that, the, uh, the new ones will, will land. Well, obviously that's enough of me sitting here rambling. We're gonna document all this going forward. So if you haven't subscribed, be sure to do so. Yeah, I promise you we're gonna get back into piggery. Those of you guys that have been missing the pig videos, um, yeah, obviously hopefully we'll have something to share as these uh, pigs make it to Red Tool Hut. Well, I hope everyone has a very Merry Christmas and you get to spend some quality time with friends and family and your farm animals. Take care. <laughs>